This episode of Engineering the Future is brought to you by The Personal, Ospie's home and auto insurance partner. These past few months have shown us just how important it is to have someone in your corner. When it comes to home and auto insurance, The Personal can be that someone. If you would like to learn more about this exclusive program, visit thepersonal.com slash Ospie. This podcast is brought to you by Ospie the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers, the advocacy body for professional engineers in the engineering community in Ontario. Welcome to Engineering the Future, a podcast presented by the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers. I am your host, Jerome James. This is a very special episode of Engineering the Future. We are right in the middle of Black History Month, and we're delighted to welcome Dr. Philip Asari from the University of Toronto. Dr. Asari is an assistant professor at the Institute for Studies in Transdisciplinary Engineering Education and Practice. He is also appointed to the Department of Engineering Science as well as the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. In addition to his teaching and leadership responsibilities, Dr. Asari has also been recently appointed the Dean's Advisor on Black Inclusivity for the University's Faculty of Engineering. So let's dive right in. Dr. Asari, our audience would love to know more about your academic journey and your unique professional path. So tell us, how did you get started and how has the journey been so far? Thanks, Jerome. I um, guess I got to start from, from the beginning. Uh, I was born and raised in Ghana. That's where the journey began. Um, and uh, did all the way through secondary school um, in Ghana. And then... Um, went to the U.S. Uh, University of Pennsylvania for my undergrad and master's in electrical engineering. Um, I got into engineering because my, my mom's an engineer. She's a civil engineer uh, by training and practice. Um, and, and the deal that we had was that um, we'd all go to engineering school, um, but you didn't have to become a professional engineer. Uh, my mom thought that <laughs> um, engineering education was a good sort of broad foundation for diving into many other disciplines. Um, and so for me, it was sort of, I was going to engineering school and the question was, which one? <laughs> um, interesting. Uh, interesting story about getting into electrical engineering. Um, I had a friend who lost his leg um, as a kid, uh, I think about age four or so, very, very young. Uh, he got run over by a truck, uh, had to wear a prosthetic. Um, and I'd always wondered why uh, we didn't have prosthetics that don't interface with the brain. Um, the way natural limbs do. Um, so I asked a couple of my mom's friends about, you know, which disciplines engage with that. And a number of them mentioned electrical engineering because it has something to do with signals and that's, that's the discipline. So that's, that's where I went, wow. um, exploring. So I picked electrical engineering because I, I guess I was interested in the kinds of things that had to do with signals and, and, and those things. So, um, that's, in that's interesting that, uh, you didn't have a choice. <laughs> I've heard that from a, from many people where um, parents might uh, say, "Oh, I'm only paying for an engineering degree," or or something sort of like in the, those lines. But really, that that engineering degree is that platform that taught you how to think, right? Did you find that you gained skills and knowledge and ways of thinking that um, others kind of missed out on if without that engineering degree? That's a very good question. I mean, I think I think we were all sort of heading in the direction of engineering anyway. Uh, my brothers and I have four brothers. Um, we we're all very interested in technology. We played a lot with Legos as as kids, um, and we're always tinkering and then building and that sort of interested in that. So even without the deal, I think it's a it's an area we all would have gone into um, eventually. It's just sort of what else did we. Uh, what we want to do with it. So um, I, as much as I was interested in engineering, I was also fascinated by people and just sort of uh, human condition and psychology um, and those kinds of things. Um, so I, I guess I wanted something where I could combine uh, a number of different perspectives. Um, and I think, you know, my mom's perspective was that with, with something like engineering, um, it sort of sets you up to engage in, in a number of other uh, disciplines, uh, which, which is true. I mean, I've, I've found a lot of people who have sort of engineering undergrad backgrounds who are all over the place, right. in law and medicine and 
in various areas. And and for me, I was interested in engineering and medicine, right? So um, that was sort of the connecting path there for me. Um, has it taught me ways of thinking that I, I think are useful? But certainly, yes. <laughs> um, you know, my wife and I talk about this all, all the time. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there, there's certainly parts of my engineering education, I think, that got me to to think about the world and see the world in ways um, that Great. are helpful. And then you ended up in, in the States. Yes, I did. Yeah, so that's what I did uh, for my undergrad and master's and PhD. So I was at the University of Pennsylvania for undergrad and master's. Um, I think I got a little bit lucky because even though I was in an electrical engineering uh, program, it was run in a department that was an electrical and systems engineering department, um, which is not a typical combination. It's often electrical and computer engineering or something of the sort closer to computer science. Um, but because it was a lot of systems engineering uh, perspective, I think uh, the thing that has stuck with me is that systems thinking, thinking broadly, like thinking about all the connections. Um, and I appreciated that about um, my engineering education. Um, what was interesting, though, going through undergrad was I, I felt like, um, I think this is sort of a general engineering education thing that people aspect of it was missing quite a bit. Um, you know, we got into engineering because um, many of us saw it as a way of sort of impacting communities and impacting people, right? I told the story about um, thinking about prosthetics and then getting into medicine. But a lot of that wasn't always present in the classroom connected to sort of the technical topics that we were learning about. So so that really got me thinking about sort of engineering education, how we do it, why we do it. Education is also something that I've been very interested in. Um, right, right. Since, you know, being in Ghana and the educational system there and just seeing different people having different sort of experiences with it. So the education and delivery portion was your was the, the the area that catapulted you from an undergraduate education to a master's or were you just very focused on learning as much as you can in that signal signal processing realm what what made you think okay i need more than this undergrad degree for what yeah, i want to very, do in life very good question i think it was, it was a combination of things so so one was the education piece big motivating factor with the education piece. So I wanted to get an education and I had realized that to get into at least higher education, you needed a PhD. Um, but I also recognized that from higher education, you could also get involved a lot in the K to 12, which is what I saw. So, um, the goal was to sort of get a PhD and get into higher education. I was also very interested in research and projects, right? So, which is the other thing that you do, um, in graduate school. So learning how to do sort of technical research and come up with new ideas and innovation was also a motivating factor. Right. Um, and so I think those are the two things that sort of got me into, you know, continuing with the masters and then, um, going on to, to look into a PhD. Um, and I enjoy doing both, um, now still working on sort of engineering projects that have impact as well as, um, also be doing the education piece. So from the States, how did you end up in Canada? Can you tell me more about your, your journey to Toronto and then a little bit more about the intent of, and how do you ended up at the institution and a little bit more of the intent of the institution and what it might mean for the future of engineers and the engineering profession? Yeah. So. But the key word is serendipity. <laughs> um, <laughs> as as uh, I tell students, sometimes life happens and, and takes you on various paths. Um, so after University of Pennsylvania, I went to University of Virginia to do my PhD. Um, when I finished, I was looking for academic jobs. Um, and so my, my first academic job was at an institution called Bucknell University in, in central Pennsylvania, um, in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. And that's that's really where I got my uh, start. Um, I guess uh, part of a personal story is, you know, I'm not from North America. So as an immigrant, you know, when you're finishing school, you need a job to stay and to, and to do that. So um, getting the job was sort of a big piece uh, for me. Bucknell actually worked out really well because it was a liberal arts institution that combined um, had an engineering college, but also had a lot of the arts and science and sort of the human dimensions I was interested in and people who wanted to collaborate across um, those disciplines. So I think it was really at Bucknell where I got a chance to explore that sort of interdisciplinary perspective um, and bringing in the human elements um, of engineering uh, there. Um, 
So before that, you didn't really see that humanistic or um, evolution of uh, of teaching of engineering, or is that where you got really into uh, the mechanics behind that? I did in in, in small glimpses. So in undergrad, um, I had a professor who taught his classes as um, his name was Santos Vankatesh, um taught his engineering math classes as sort of a history an introduction to the history of the ideas as well as the technical ideas. And I really loved that. Um, so that brought a bit of a human dimension to the, the work um, that we were doing. I was also fortunate to be part of the technical communication program um, that was helping um, students with their sort of engineering communication skills. Um, and so there was a bit of a human element. Who are you talking to? Um, what's your audience? And then often those things were happening in classes that were um, sort of ethics and sort of humanistic inclined. Uh, so I got some of that in undergrad, uh, not a lot. Um, in grad school, because I was doing engineering and medicine, those things came up quite a bit um, because you can't get away from the people, right? You're doing interdisciplinary work. Um, you see the dynamics of that um, and how even closely related disciplines have a lot of differences that you have to navigate. Um, right. Was there and then some the clinical impact el to, elements yeah. as well? Yeah, exactly. We were doing human subject studies. There were, you know, real people um, engaging with the devices that we were putting together. And then the, these things had potential for impacts on their health. Um, I actually did a lot of work with the uh, U.S. Food and Drug Administration that regulates medical devices. Um, so looking at safety, uh, patient safety. So kind of thinking about, again, all the different dimensions, the different people who have to think about that, how they come at it differently, and also the patients themselves. Um, and how we might put together devices for them. So I, I got a, I got a glimpse of that in sort of a very technical way. Right. Um, and, and in the outreach work that I was doing, I was starting to explore this idea of sort of engineering being a sort of human activity with the students that I was working with. So I think after grad school at Bucknell, when I had a bit more, I'd say sort of control over the way I did my work is when I got to dive into that a bit more um, with a bit more, I'd say, freedom um, and agency. So, yeah. Okay, yeah, and then, and then you were looking for positions, academic positions that that uh, led you to the U of T. Um, that was the serendipity part. So uh, that was life. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so my my partner moved to uh, Toronto um, at some point uh, when I was at Bucknell, and so uh, we were sort of doing a cross border. <laughs> uh, a family, um, and at some point, you know, kids get into the picture, and you have to make a decision. <laughs> um, it gets a little bit unwieldy, so that was the decision point. And so, at that point, that got me looking for academic positions um, in Canada uh, to make that work. Um, U of T happened to have this position at the time that I was planning to move, <laughs> um, and, it, and it fit really uh, well. I mean. It, um, with ISTEP being new and their focus on this sort of transdisciplinary area, um, the connection with engineering science and engineering design, where a lot of these humanistic things show up. Um, you know, a couple of my colleagues at Bucknell would comment, are you sure they didn't write this position just for you? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, and saw the ad and it I was too perfect. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was great. Uh, it was great timing uh, and everything. So I, I went for it. Um, and, and got the position and, and it's been um, fun uh, trying to work on these things here as well. We hope you're enjoying this episode so far. At OSPI, we're here for you, making sure government, media, and the public are listening to the voice of engineers. You can learn more at ospi.on.ca. You are also the current Dean Advisor on Black Inclusivity at U of T. Can you touch on a little bit about uh, your advisory role, um, how it affects your education research, and how these things kind of roll into education for people of color, especially within technical STEM uh, backgrounds or uh, areas of study? How 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 is this kind of colored? your experience at U of T? Um, yeah, so I guess prior to U of T, I had been involved in um, equity, diversity, and inclusion work. Um, I think uh, I've mentioned to other folks that uh, 
for me, um, you know, the notion of being black, uh, the way it's constructed in North America was, was foreign to me until I came here. <laughs> um, and so being in, in the Philadelphia area, um, and getting again through serendipity involved in outreach work, um, and seeing sort of underrepresentation engineering, it's something I've been working on for, for quite a while. Um, first starting off in outreach in undergrad and masters and PhD. And then actually starting to do some research and other initiatives when I was at Bucknell, um, worked on a study called People Like Me, um, where we were looking at role models and mentors and the ways in which we present these to underrepresented students to sort of increase motivation uh, for the discipline. Um, and then came to U of T, uh, recognizing that similar issues uh, are here in Canada and continued to sort of do that work, working with um, the various groups within the faculty. Um, there's the EDI action group that does some work. I am on the sort of uh, governing committee that's responsible for EDI um, as well. And so had been sort of involved in various spaces, you know, did some work, continued to do work with outreach office as well. Um, and so the sort of Dean's advisor was a bit of a natural transition. <laughs> um, there, uh, the Dean's advisor roles are relatively new. So I think they're still being conceptualized. Um, and I guess the, the person who takes the role gets to shape it a little bit. Um, uh, I see the role as a sort of strategic, um, in the sense of collaborating with, uh, units around the faculty to, um, work on their EDI goals. Um, so, so for me, um, I, 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 my model of EDI is that it's everyone's work, um, and it's not the work of a specific office or a specific group of people to sort of hold that weight for the rest of the institution. Right. Would you say that different, uh, schools or departments display different versions of their own understanding of EDI and they wanted some sort of cohesive um, strategy at U of T or, um, how is, how is that kind of rolled out before you, um, before you? Yeah. So I think my personal impression is everyone's still trying to figure it out. <laughs> okay. Um, I think, uh, what I've seen is happening and not just here and in the U S right there, there within departments and various entities within the institution, they are working on their own local EDI, um, issues um and so they're coming up with their strategies and often there are these roles either in the dean's office or centrally at the university level that are helping to inform that um and coordinate um those activities uh and so i think that has kind of been the model sometimes these roles are taking on quite a bit of work in, in various specific initiatives and leading those um and so I, um, yeah, I think different people have different models on, you know, in terms of what EDI work is and where the potential issues are and how you, you address it. So I think there's some folks who take a bit more of a programmatic lens, right? So if we have these programs and these support systems, they will help resolve some of the issues. Um, there are others who are taking more of a, I'd say, systemic lens and saying, well, we have institutional structures that may be contributing to these and how do we review them, revise them, change them so that um, they are sort of the institution itself and the way that it operates is more inclusive. Academic structures. Can, can you break it down for us? Is there one, like an example of something that you see is problematic that, uh, maybe many schools are falling into that don't necessarily serve, um, the black population or populations of color that are, uh, areas that you've identified that are maybe low hanging fruit that can be improved into the future or is it mostly um a long haul trudge uh to get any type of change and you can you can contrast by your experience in the states versus how you see things going forward in Canada so yeah i guess we're we're getting into the thorny thorny places here um <laughs> so Let's see, how, how do I put this? So I think part of it is historical, right? So, um, you know, when, when the institutions were conceptualized, the structures were built, engineering was built, there weren't a lot of BIPOC people in the, um, in the institution, right? So not a lot of them were attending. And so 
what institutions do is they shape themselves around who's there, right? And that becomes uh, tradition. So there's an assumption about, you know, students who are coming in, what is their background, what is their culture, what is their worldview, what is their knowledge, and what is valued. Um, that gets baked in and 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 that becomes the way things are done. But as new people with different backgrounds and values come in, that hasn't changed. So you don't feel sort of welcome. So I, I've been reading a book uh, recently called Engineering Justice, um, written by some two folks at the Colorado School of Mines, I believe. Um, and, you know, they talk about, you know, even in an engineering classroom, when you're doing like analysis of beams, the civil engineering class, like whose beams you're analyzing matter, right? <laughs> right. Um, and so that, that kind of hints about whose perspective and whose society um, has privilege. So, I mean, simple things like even the examples that we use in class, right? Or or the people we highlight are those who have made contributions to, to the fields, right? So, um, there was the book and the movie that came out recently, recently Hidden Figures and all the contributions that black mathematicians had made to um, the space race that we weren't Absolutely. aware of, right? And computer programming. Um, if things like that aren't getting highlighted in the classroom as part of the way we present sort of the discipline and its development, because that's partly what we do um, when we're doing these things, um, then people like me don't feel welcome or don't see ourselves as, as part of the, of the profession, right? So... I'd say there's like relatively simple tweaks like that in sort of thinking about the examples you use, who you highlight, um, and also how you structure your classroom. Again, you know, school and classrooms and curricula are structured around a certain kind of student who has a certain amount of time and particular kinds of obligations, right? And that, and and so, but the academic structures are built all around that. And so, again, when students are coming from a different background, maybe different family setup, different responsibilities. Um, different motivations and how they're navigating uh, the institution, that can get in the way because it doesn't assume them. Right. So making sure that the the technical history is also uh, included in technical fields and making f uh, students from all different backgrounds feel included and that their history is, is uh, relevant in their area of field uh, will make them feel more included in that field. Yeah. And then that, you know, applications of engineering to their community matters, right? Um, so that that's all uh, part of that. Yeah. Can you uh, maybe touch on uh, how education is shifting full throttle into this new age of uh, increased AI accessibility, um, just new techniques of teaching, new instruments, new ideas. Where do you see uh, education education uh, evolving in the near future? Yeah, that's another thorny, thorny one. Um, yeah, I mean, I've had this discussion with my students in the past, right? So, I mean, if you think about education, there's there's various tools and resources that exist that have different kinds of value, right? So um, I would often tell students, I'm like, if I, if I stand in front of the classroom and I repeat to you things that you can already easily access for free, that's, that's a waste of our time, right? The value that I bring as an educator is not in sort of standing there and telling you facts that are easily accessible, right? Um, in the age of search and even AI, right? I think the value that I bring as an educator, at least I see personally, is in helping students sort of make sense of all those things, right? Understand how they are developed um, and, and sort of picking up, I'd say, process skills, right? How do you learn? How do you make sense of information? Because there's a lot of information available. How do you filter the information? Um, how do you get to information that's useful and valuable and how do you leverage that in the work that you, um, you're doing? And then that's something that a search engine really can't teach you. Um, and an AI probably couldn't. I mean, you could see examples of it in the way that something like ChatGPT might explain how it comes to its, its answers. Um, but there's a certain sort of facilitating of the education that, um, uh, educators do. Um, right. You still need to get out of the classroom. Learn. Yep. Yeah. So the, the, there's the value in being in the classroom, right? And and interacting with a human who is curating an environment that's going to help you learn. Um, and I think that's the big shift that I've seen, especially in engineering education, 
um, even before the advent of um, these sort of language models that are um, that doing things right, which is sort of uh, moving to a model where um, we focus on helping students uh, pick up these process skills um, and um, these learning skills, um, as opposed to um, a focus on sort of delivering information, right, which is just putting out. Um, the facts. So are you and, pessimistic and, or optimistic on the near future with these tools? Um, the, t I mean, all these tools are double-edged swords, right? Um, a, a tool is only as useful as you, you make it, right? Um, and so, and, and that's the thing, right? I think the key word is tool, right? I think people need to understand, um, that these things are potentially useful tools, but they are also potentially dangerous tools, right? Um, and so, um, and you need ways to kind of verify and validate, um, the information that you're, you're getting out of the tool, um, so that you're sure you can, you can leverage that information in the way that you use, right? So just taking the information blindly, um, and, and using it, um, can be dangerous because the tools have limitations in the ways that they're, they're developed. Um, they, you know, others have raised issues about the development of the tools themselves and the way that they harvest information. Right. So there's a lot of issues to contend with, um, with the tool. There are also great learning opportunities, right? It's a piece of technology, <laughs> right. Uh -huh. Um, that is, you know, from my discipline, uh, electrical computer engineering and and even the conversation about like, how do you develop these tools? Should we develop them? What is their utility? Who are they helping? Who are they harming? Who are they leaving out? Um, you know, what is the potential danger is, is, a, is important. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of, and we've already seen areas where technology doesn't recognize darker skin, uh, things that have been overlooked in beta testing for different, uh, diverse populations. So that definitely needs to be in the conversation when these tools are being developed. Personally, I'm cautious, <laughs> let's just say, um, <laughs> often uh, cautious about, about the hype. I think there's some, there's some impressive things that these tools are capable of, but there's, there's always the sort of things to watch out for. Um, and also thinking critically, I, I don't think we have good consensus yet on where all these things fit. I think that's also going to sort of evolve in the way we see the role that these things play in education. I see. But I also think that then it has to be sort of co-developed, right? Like having a company just go out and put out these things and have the education sort of react to it. Um, is it sort of, I'd say the best model of development, if, if it's going to be useful for education, then there has to be that input from educators and, and people being educated in there to say, how might this be useful for the enterprise? Um, that we're, we're engaged it. Great. Um, so yeah. As an organization, OSPI is committed to increasing equity, diversity, and inclusion within the engineering community. Given your experience and what UFT is trying to achieve, do you have any advice on how to do this in a meaningful way? Um, yeah, that's a good one. Uh, I have some, um, but you know, I, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm the expert on all of this. Um, like I said, I'm of the perspective that we need to focus on the systemic issues, um, and, and the structural, um, issues, um, out there. I mean, there's, you know, the analogy that's, that's often been used as sort of the leaky pipeline, um, analogy. And I feel like a lot of what we try to do is, can you, can you explain what the leaky pipeline analogy is? Um, so the leaky pipeline is sort of if engineering or STEM is a career path and people are kind of flowing through this pipe to get into industry and then through the career that we're losing sort of BIPOC people because the pipeline, the pipe is leaky in some way, right? They're, they're leaking out of the pipe. Um, I feel like the, the approach that we typically take is sort of, I'd say sort of fixing the fluid through the pipe, right? Like we focus on the people, which I think is, is good. We have to acknowledge that there are people who are, who are being left out, but we don't focus on the pipe, right? So if a pipe's leaking, right, you fix the pipe, right? Um, if, if there are new fluids that weren't anticipated for the pipe coming in, then you have to adapt to the pipe itself to make sure that everyone flows through, right? Exactly. And so for me, that's sort of focusing on the systemic structures, right? It's sort of what is engineering today, how it has been conceptualized throughout history, um, where these people in mind when we were developing the profession, the answer is 
no, really. And so now that they are here and want to be a part of the profession, um, how do we adapt and make uh, the work that we're doing more inclusive um, for them and their societies um, that they're coming from? And so that's why I think, you know, focusing on the structures and in industry structures, um, you know, workplace practices, also academic structures, like I've talked about, um, and, and the various ways in which we, we acknowledge difference and support difference um, is, is going to be important. Great. Um, I feel like that covers it. Is there anything else that you'd like to add um, on this topic that we haven't touched on yet? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the last thing that I'd say is maybe you asked this a little bit, is this going to be sort of um, drudge work? Um, I think so long as we're committed to getting there, um, that that's important, right? I think there's going to be some challenges along the way. And in any enterprise, there's there's missteps. We have to kind of work through certain things that are going to come up. It's not going to be all rosy. Um, but I think the commitment to actually doing the work uh, is, is important. Um, and the continuing to, you know, work on change despite the challenges, despite the difficult conversations that need to be have had, um, I think is, is key to getting us to, to where we, we want to go. I feel like this is just the start of many conversations that we could have about the engineering profession today and where engineering education for black and BIPOC youth needs to go into the future. Thank you so much for joining me today, Dr. Asari. Uh, Thanks for your time. I'm, I was thrilled to be able to have the chance to connect with you and talk about these uh, important conversations that uh, we definitely need to have in the engineering community in Ontario. Thanks for having me, Jerome. Once again, I've been speaking to Dr. Philip Asari from the University of Toronto. I am your host, Jerome James. This has been Engineering the Future. Thanks for listening. From all of us at OSPI, the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers, thanks for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode.